little bit about God image. I think this is important. And how do I go about this? It, you know, if you look at human history, there are scads of gods. I mean, and they're in all different shapes and sizes and images, um, personality types. I mean, it's just, it really is almost like us. I mean, <laughs> a variety of the yin-yang. But, you know, if you really study them and uh, look at pictures especially of them, because we have lots of pictures of idols. You know, they don't look too good. <laughs> I don't really, I can't really think of any of any idol that I thought, oh man, that's a really pretty God. Or, oh my, that must be a really, that'd be a really neat God to have. <laughs> In fact, quite to the contrary, some of the gods that we have made are really, really ugly, cold, indifferent, and even angry and hostile. So it begs the question, what, can't you come up with some decent gods? <laughs> you know, if you're going to come up with a, um, uh, you know, if you're going to make your own god, your own picture of god, can't you come up with something decent? <laughs> well, some that I've thought about quite often is let's just kind of pull it away from idols and all that and what if what if you had the privilege of meeting a somebody from another galaxy a uh, an alien of some sort and, and uh on a, uh, somehow or another just picture this it, you you have an arrangement for a meeting with that person. Somebody has communicated to you that you have been chosen to meet an alien from you know another galaxy, specially chosen. And so, the arrangement's made, and there's a particular room you go in. But you're told you're told that they're invisible that to your eyes. You can't see them, but they can see you. So you, on that day, you come in and you sit down at the table and what do you do? And what do you think about? How do you, without any data points, what kinds of pictures would fill your mind? What, how would you internalize that invisible being. And here's my conjecture on it. I, I think that we project from within. And so if you uh, think a lot about sex and exploitation of women, I think that you might tend to think that that alien might be that way and you might want to keep that alien away from any of your wife, you know, or girlfriend that you've got at the time. Or if if you are a habitual liar and there's no nothing that you say is trustworthy hardly, you might even without knowing or seeing or having any real data points, you might project that onto the alien. In other words, our own untrustworthiness, our own brokenness, our own evil, as it were, uh, is often projected onto our gods, uh, frankly, our internal God image. Um, and if you look, if you look it over at the, the lists of gods and the description of the gods and the personality types of the gods and the, and as I said, the pictures of the gods, it's really self-evident that, hey, <laughs> there's something kind of twisted about us human beings when it comes to our gods. Um, and that can cause a lot of pain.
But there's something even, I think, deeper and more profound, or at least to me it is. Our first God, our first God encounter, this may sound strange, but I really believe it's true on a real basic way, is our dad's. I mean, when we're a little person, he is our transcendent one. He is, and you know, with some boys, dad is just, there's nobody stronger than dad. There's nobody smarter than dad. There's no, you know, now that's if you've got a good relationship with your dad. But it can also be the contrary. I mean, you you can have an abusive father, a distant father, a cold father, an angry father. But likewise, that's your first God. And, you know, when I say that, I tremble inside because I know there will come a day when the truth will be exposed and we'll see all of our mistakes for what they are as well as, you know, what we've tried to do right. But, you know, we have been imperfect fathers. All of us. All of us. There's no perfect father among us. And we intend to do what's right, most of us, with respect to our children. But oftentimes we don't really completely cut the mustard. And, and I think if we were honest with ourselves, we'd agree with that. And, and so our children, frankly, have a God image, um, a God image handicap. They're entering life not really seeing the fullness of love, of cher being cherished, of being delighted in. Uh, so, you know, I, <laughs> I think many of us fathers do our best but honest to goodness with our brokenness, our busyness, our our own hurts, our own angers, and our own fathers. It's tough. It's tough. It's really tough. And, and, and many of us have regrets. We wish we could take it back, you know, and relive it. But it affects us. And I know that this is maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but I honestly believe that some of the most militant atheists, if you lined them up and you did a biography of them, looked into their lives, and, I, and I'm, pretty, I'm pretty convinced of this truth because I've read various stories, I can't quote things, and I, I could be mistaken. I think many of them really had bad dads. <laughs> They had bad dads. And so there was a bitterness that entered into their soul. Um, and a rage that really is now directed toward God. And it's not that we can't rise above it as human beings. But man, it's a handicap. It's a handicap because our psyches, uh, as little people, our psyches and our capacity to trust, to, to love, and, to, and to, to thrive in the world is largely shaped by those initial experiences with mom and dad and the closeness we feel or don't feel with them. So anyway, that's a, another thought to think about in connection with all this.